He's one of the most slept on athletes in the history of the NBA. He stood at 6 foot 9 and a solid 240 pounds, but had one of the highest measured verticals in league history. That combination alone is enough to get you a shot at the NBA, but Antonio McDice worked to be so much more than that over his career. It's true he could run the floor with ease and end the break with some of the most angry dunks you'll ever see, and that anger and athleticism was present on the defensive end when he'd reject shots. But he also could slash and finish, had a post game that seemed to improve every year, and was one of the league's best mid-range shooters as a big man. He was a pick and roll finisher during his first few seasons with the Nuggets and Suns, but after a knee injury stole a couple years of his prime and a lot of his athleticism, he became more of a pick and pop role player on some great Pistons and Spurs teams. But regardless of what stage of his career he was in, he was always important to his team. And even if he wasn't the same offensively, he remained an underrated defender from start to finish. When healthy, he was a great power forward, but he played during the golden era of power forwards. Add in spending his best years on bad teams, and injuries causing a steep production decline, and it's easy to forget about him. But Antonio McDice remained productive and professional from his first to his final game, and did a lot of damage in between, and that deserves more recognition. Let's jog your memory. A Mississippi native, Antonio McDice attended Quitman High School, where when he started playing, he was going off of pure ability and talent. As McDice would say that when he first started, he had no idea what he was being told to do. Yet even so, as early as his sophomore season, he was averaging 29 points per game. By the time he was a senior, McDice would average 25.8 points, 14.7 rebounds, and 5.3 blocks per game, while being named a second team parade All-American. And he would really impress at the ABCD camp, where University of Alabama assistant coach James Green caught a glimpse of McDice's potential and would eventually offer him a scholarship, and he would accept so he would be a member of the Crimson Tide going into the 94 college season. Alabama hadn't been great in 93 and had just lost their best player James Robinson to the NBA. They would still retain a couple solid juniors in forward Jamal Faulkner and future NBAer Jason Caffey. McDice would appear in 26 games during the 94 season and would be eased into a larger role as he would start 15 of those games. And although he received less than 24 minutes per game, he would still act as the team's best rebounder and third leading scorer on over 56% shooting. And his two-way ability was also on display, as he was the only member of the team to average over a block and steal per game. Alabama was an average offensive team and good defensive team, but the highlight of their regular season would be an upset of number one ranked Arkansas, where McDice hit the go-ahead bucket with about four and a half minutes left in the game. Alabama would improve on last year and would finish the regular season on a five-game win streak to enter the SEC tournament at 18-8, but after running through Auburn, they would lose to Florida in the semifinal. Yet at 19-9, they would get a tournament bid as a nine seed. The first round would see Alabama take on and defeat Providence, as McDice would play 21 minutes off the bench, scoring an efficient 11 points on 5-9 of nine shooting, while also pulling down a game-high 12 rebounds to help Alabama advance to a second round matchup versus top seeded Purdue. Although Alabama put up a good fight, Glenn Robinson's 33 points was too much, as the Crimson Tide would lose by 10, but McDice again played well, with 13 points on 6 of 11 shooting, while again pulling down a game high 12 rebounds, and also recording 2 blocks and 2 steals. So even though McDice was raw, he was clearly improving, and hopes were high for his sophomore season, but his freshman year saw him average about 11.5 points, 8 rebounds, and 1.5 and blocks per game. McDice would get a larger role as a sophomore, playing and starting in every game, yet somewhat surprisingly, only getting about 26 minutes per game. Yet this was partially due to McDice's tendency to get into foul trouble, but when he was on the court, he was great, as he would average a double-double, leading Alabama in scoring and rebounding, while finishing second in block shots, and he would even lead the conference in rebounding. Once again, Alabama possessed an average offense, but their defense was their strength, as they would have the 15th ranked scoring defense in the nation. They would start the season at 8-2 before going 12-6 the rest of the way to finish at 20-8, with the highlight of their regular season being a win against defending national champion Arkansas at Bud Walton Arena. So up to this point, McDice had been good, but he wasn't really in the NBA conversation yet. But then during the 95 college postseason, he would change that. After defeating Tennessee in the first round of the SEC tournament, the second round would bring Georgia, where McDice would put up 22 points and pull down 14 rebounds in a win. Then in a semifinals loss to Arkansas, he would record 14 points and pull down 20 rebounds. Alabama hadn't won the SEC, but they would get a tournament bid as a five seed, 
and in the first round versus Penn, McDice put together his best college game, as in a 6 point overtime win, he would drop 39 points on 16 of 24 shooting, while pulling down 19 rebounds and adding 2 blocks. The second round brought a great Oklahoma State team led by Bryant Reeves, and although McDice couldn't do exactly what he did last game, he still finished with a team high 22 points and 17 rebounds, along with 2 blocks. But in the second half, McDice would come down hard on his knee, leading to him sitting for a few minutes. And in that time, Oklahoma State would go on an 8-2 run to take the lead for good as the Crimson Tide would fall to the Cowboys, ending their season. But McDice's sophomore season would see him average about 14 points, 10 rebounds, and 2 blocks per game. So in a span of less than 10 days, McDice had not only put himself in the NBA conversation, he was now being talked about as a top 5 pick. And this is not what anyone thought would happen before the start of the season, as even McDice would say that going pro hadn't even entered his mind until after his great postseason play. But he would decide to strike while the iron was hot and declare for the 95 NBA draft. McDice was a raw prospect, but he had high upside. And one thing you were guaranteed to get with him was freakish athleticism, as during a vertical test at Alabama, McDice would knock over the Vertec machine which eventually led to his vertical being measured at 42 inches. And to substantiate that, during a pre-draft workout with Washington, McDice was routinely getting his hand above the white square. And although Washington held the number 4 pick in the draft, McDice would already be off the board once they got to their pick. With the second pick in the 1995 NBA draft, the Los Angeles Clippers select Antonio McDice from the University of Alabama. So McDice was taken second overall by the Clippers but he would almost immediately be packaged along with reserve guard Randy Woods in a trade to Denver for the 16th overall pick Brent Berry and a proven forward in Rodney Rogers. As Clippers head coach Bill Fitch would say that as good as McDice may eventually be, the Clippers couldn't afford to have another season like they did in 95 when they went 17 and 65. But back to McDice. So the rookie McDice joined what looked like a deep Nuggets team who featured the reigning defensive player of the year in Dikembe Mutombo a high-scoring guard in Mahmoud abdul Rauf, and their top pick from the year before in Jalen Rose. So along with many other solid pieces, it looked like only a matter of time before the Nuggets were competitive, assuming McDice could adjust to the improved competition of the NBA. And while he had some growing pains, it was clear pretty early that McDice belonged in the league. He would be a day one starter, acting as one of eight players to average double figures, while being the team's second leading rebounder and shot blocker. He would hit double figures in 54 games, record 3 games with at least 30, and 20 double doubles, as his great play would see him voted to the Rising Stars game at All-Star Weekend, as well as be voted first team All-Rookie. And among rookies, he was top 10 in scoring, top 5 in blocks, and top 3 in rebounds. Abdul Rauf was the team's top scorer, but he would appear in just 57 games this year, as he would find himself in the middle of a major controversy due to him not standing during the National Anthem. And after an 0-6 start to the season, the Nuggets just couldn't get back on track, as they would finish the year at 35-47 and, and miss the playoffs, as McDice would average about 13.5 points, 7.5 rebounds, and 1.5 blocks per game. To begin the 97 season, the Nuggets were looking a lot different. Matumbo had left to sign with Atlanta, and Denver had traded Abdul Rauf to the Kings, while also trading the young Jalen Rose to Indiana for a veteran point guard in Mark Jackson. This meant McDice would have a much larger role in 97, and he would respond with great improvement, as he would finish as the team's second leading scorer at over 18 points per game, while remaining their second best rebounder and shot blocker. McDice would play and start in 74 games, as he would hit double figures in 66 of them, while scoring at least 30 in 5 of those games. And he would also record 19 double doubles on the year. After a 4-9 start, head coach and general manager Bernie Bickerstaff resigned from his coaching position, and was replaced by assistant Dick Mata. But under Mata, the Nuggets would go 17-52, and 52, as they had one of the worst defenses in the league. Additionally, at the trade deadline, the Pacers would trade to reacquire Jackson from the Nuggets, which was too bad for McDice, as Jackson was leading the league in assists and had developed a nice rapport with McDice. So the Nuggets would end up finishing with a 21-61 and 61 record and obviously miss the playoffs, as McDice's improved second season saw him average about 18.5 points, 7.5 rebounds, and 1.5 blocks per game. During the 97 offseason, it was time to start negotiating for a new contract, as McDice had a year left on his rookie deal. 
but he was looking for a six-year deal worth upwards of $100 million. And the Nuggets just hadn't seen enough from him to justify that. So at the risk of losing him for nothing, they would decide to orchestrate a three-team deal, which saw him end up in Phoenix, where he looked to be a perfect complement in the pick and roll to Phoenix's all-star point guard Jason Kidd. McDice had already shown his slashing and ability to run the floor, and with a fast-paced point guard like Kidd, who was one of the league's best passers, these two looked like a match made in heaven. And the Suns had also signed veteran Cliff Robinson earlier, whose shooting ability would help space the floor for McDice and Kidd to operate. And they would do exactly that during the 98 season. Now on a good team, McDice and Kidd formed a quick connection which led to exciting offense. But the addition of Robinson was helpful, and the Suns received a relatively healthy year from combo guard Rex Chapman. The Suns would play at a top 10 pace in the league, which would result in them having the 6th highest scoring offense. McDice would be the team's top rebounder and shot blocker, while finishing as their second leading scorer. His scoring numbers had dropped by over 3 points per game, but this was in part due to Phoenix's offense, with kids spreading the ball around. However, he scored very efficiently, on a career-high 53.6% shooting. And it wasn't just great offense he was providing, it was also defense, as he would average over a block and steal per game, and finish with the league's 10th lowest defensive rating. McDice would hit double figures in 66 games, while recording 24 double-doubles, and most importantly, the Suns were winning, as by the All-Star break they were 31-15, and, and would go 25-11 and the rest of the way, including winning 11 of their last 12, to finish at 56 and 26 and get a first round matchup with the Spurs. McDice would get a difficult matchup in his playoff debut, going against Tim Duncan and David Robinson, but he would hold his own as he led the Suns in scoring and rebounding for the series. But Duncan would average over 20 points on over 57% shooting as well. In a game one loss, McDice would have 14 points and four blocks. Then in a game two win, he would have 21 points and 11 rebounds on over 57% shooting. A Game 3 loss would see him go for a postseason career high 26 points and 17 rebounds, but then facing elimination in Game 4, he would only put up 10 points on 5 of 14 shooting, although he would pull down a postseason career high of 19 rebounds. Yet the Suns would lose to end their season, and McDice's first season in Phoenix would see him average about 15 points, 7.5 rebounds, and 1.5 blocks per game. But McDice's first season in Phoenix would also be his last, at least for now. In a now infamous story, McDice was a free agent, and due to the lockout, free agency would be delayed this year until January 18th, with the season set to begin on February 5th, meaning teams had a short window to get their rosters together. But that also gave McDice a lot of extra time to think about where he wanted to sign. The Suns wanted him back, but at some point he started to have thoughts about returning to Denver and would contact GM Dan Issel, who would waste no time getting McDice to Denver. And it seemed like they got him, as just four days after free agency started, there was a press conference set to announce his return, but it would end up being delayed indefinitely, after McDice had changed his mind about signing with Denver upon his arrival, as reportedly he was unhappy that Denver was planning to release his friend Lafonso Ellis. So he would give Jason Kidd a call to tell him about his second thoughts. And obviously Kidd wanted McDice back after the season they just had, so he would tell McDice that he was on his way to Denver and to not make any decisions before he, Rex Chapman, and George McLeod got there. But when Issel got word of this, he would bring in his own reinforcements, in the form of members of the coaching staff and their newly acquired point guard Nick Van Exel, as they would all attend a Colorado Avalanche game that night. But Issel had more tricks up his sleeve. As once McDice shared that Avalanche goalie Patrick Waugh was his favorite player, Issel arranged for Waugh to meet with them and present McDice with a signed stick, but he also directed all security and ticket staff to not let in any of the Suns players that he knew were coming to McDice's rescue. And that's what would happen, as once they arrived, they were first told that McDice didn't want to see them, but when Chapman called that bluff, security admitted that they were just doing what they had been told to do. And by the time the game was over, McDice had reportedly signed a six-year, $67.5 million deal at the arena. Even though McLeod had tried his pager 25 times with no response in a last-ditch effort to retain McDice, as McDice was about to play his best basketball on some far-from-the-best Nuggets teams. So the Nuggets' new core featured McDice and the exciting Nick Van Exel, while also featuring point guard Chauncey Billups who they had traded for on the same day of the McDice signing. These three would be the team's top scorers, as McDice would have a career year, leading the team in scoring, rebounding, steals, and blocks, as his points, steals, and blocks per game were a career high. And he would also finish as a top 10 scorer, rebounder, and shot blocker in the league this season. And although he wouldn't be an all-star this season, he would be named third-team All-NBA. 
he would play and start in all 50 games as he would hit double figures in every game and record 28 double doubles as he would score his career high of 46 points on 16 of 25 shooting to go along with 19 rebounds and four blocks in a February 28th win over Vancouver. The Nuggets were coached by Mike D'Antoni and with guys like Van Exel and McDice, they operated the sixth fastest pace in the league while having a top 10 scoring offense but they would also allow the second most points in the league, and after ending the season on a seven-game losing streak, they would finish at 14-36 and 36 and miss the playoffs. But for the regular season, McDice averaged about 21 points, 10.5 rebounds, and 2.5 and blocks per game. Issel clearly wasn't happy with how the team performed, as he would insert himself as head coach going into the 2000 season. The Nuggets had picked up James Posey in the draft, and had traded for Ron Mercer in the offseason. But they didn't waste much time before trading Mercer and Billups, who had been injured a lot of the year, to Orlando on February 1st. McDice and Van Exel were still the constants on the team, as the two combined for over 35 points per game, and Van Exel averaged a career-high 9 assists per game. Although McDice had seen a slight drop in his scoring, he would shoot over 50% from the field. He would hit double figures in 76 games, while also recording 31 double-doubles, including a 30-point, 21-rebound game in an April 15th win over the Clippers. Under Issel, the Nuggets were a quite similar team, with a slightly worse offense and slightly better defense. So it wasn't all that surprising that they finished at 35-47 and 47 and missed the playoffs, as McDice would average about 19 points, 8.5 rebounds, and 1.5 and blocks per game. Luckily for McDice, over the summer he would get a taste of winning, as he would suit up for the US Olympic team in the 2000 Sydney Summer Olympics. McDice would appear in all 8 games, averaging about 7.5 points and 6 rebounds per game, as the US took home the gold medal. The 01 season would be the peak of McDice's individual career. The Nuggets started the season looking pretty much the same, aside from acquiring Vashawn Leonard in the offseason. But once again, the duo of McDice and Van Exel would be their best weapons, as the two combined for over 38 points per game. McDice would lead the team as he would average over 20 points per game for the second and final time of his career, which would also be a top 20 mark in the league. And his career high 12.1 rebounds per game would lead the team and be fifth in the league as McDice would be voted to his first and only career All-Star game this season. McDice would hit double figures in 64 games while recording 51 double-doubles, and his best game of the season would come on November 30th in a loss to Houston, when he would drop 40 points on 15 of 28 shooting while also pulling down 20 rebounds and blocking 4 shots. But unfortunately for McDice, late in the season, he would suffer a partially dislocated left kneecap which would force him to miss 7 of the final 8 games of the year, as the Nuggets would finish at 40-42 and 42 and miss the playoffs. And McDice would average about 21 points, 12 rebounds, and 1.5 and blocks per game. But this would be the last time that McDice would play at this level, as the next 2 years completely changed his career. During the preseason going into the 0-2 season, McDice was experiencing patella tendonitis in his left knee. And after an MRI, it was determined that he had suffered a partially torn patellar tendon and an MCL sprain. He had been rehabbing the injured knee all offseason, but after just a few days back practicing, it was bothering him again, and this would lead to McDice requiring surgery, which was expected to keep him out for at least 3 months. So he would have the surgery, and the 3 months would turn into 6 months, and he wouldn't make his return until March 1st, with the Nuggets sitting at 17 and 38. And at this point, they looked a lot different, as they had traded away their 2nd and 3rd best players around the trade deadline in Van Exel and Rafe LaFrance. So McDice was back as a starter, but after his recovery time had taken so much longer than expected, it may have been better to just shut him down for the season, as after playing in 10 games, his knee would cause him more discomfort, and he would sit out the rest of the season starting in late March, as the Nuggets would go 27-55 and 55 and miss the playoffs, with McDice averaging about 11.5 points, 5.5 rebounds, and a block in his 10 games. On draft day 2002, the Nuggets pulled off what ended up being a robbery of a trade, as they would send McDice and a second round pick to the Knicks, for Mark Jackson, Marcus Camby, and the rights to the 7th overall pick of the draft in Nene Hilario. So the Knicks were really betting on McDice coming back strong from his injury in 03, but instead, he wouldn't even play a regular season game for the team this year. Antonio McDice playing late in the fourth quarter in a preseason game, going down for what may be a season-ending injury. Broken kneecap, he thinks he might be back in the springtime, but that remains to be seen. Late in an October 8th preseason game, McDice would come down awkwardly on his knee, resulting in a broken kneecap, which would eventually require season-ending surgery, as Knicks coach Don Chaney would catch a lot of criticism for even keeping McDice in the game that late during the preseason. So McDice would spend his 03 season rehabbing and getting ready for a healthier 04 campaign, 
McDice would still be recovering come the 04 season opener, but he returned to practice in early November and reportedly looked great. The Knicks would remain cautious and hold him out for a few more weeks before he made his debut versus Detroit on December 1st, marking his first regular season appearance in over 20 months, as he would have 2 points and 3 rebounds in 12 minutes off the bench. He would play 18 games for the team over the next month, but then on January 5th, he would finally have his reunion with Phoenix, as his massive expiring contract acted as perfect salary filler for the Knicks to acquire Stephon Marbury and Penny Hardaway from the Suns as McDice would be a veteran joining a young Suns team with players like Sean Marion and Joe Johnson, as well as a second year power forward, whose game had a lot of similarities to a pre-injury McDice in Amare Stoudemire. The Suns were 12 and 23 at the time of the trade and would go 17 and 30 the rest of the way, with McDice appearing in 24 of those games and starting 14 of them. But now a slower McDice wasn't a great fit for the fast paced offense of coach Mike D'Antoni, which McDice had once excelled in when he was in Denver as he would only put up about 6 points and 6 rebounds per game for a Suns team that finished 29-53 and 53 and missed the playoffs, as McDice's overall season saw him average about 7 points, 6 rebounds, and half a block per game. The Suns needed all the money they could to make a run at Steve Nash in the offseason, so Phoenix would let McDice walk, but he would find his way to a 4-year deal with the defending champion Detroit Pistons, where even though he would never be the player he once was, he became one of the league's most valuable role players on one of the most dominant teams of the 21st century. McDice joined a Pistons team featuring an incredible defense and a complete starting five of Chauncey Billups, Rip Hamilton, Tayshawn Prince, Ben, and Rashid Wallace, as McDice would take on the role of sixth man. At this point, McDice didn't really have his athletic advantage anymore, but had always had a solid mid-range shot and would perfect it during his time in Detroit, as he went from being a pick-and-roll player pre-injury to a pick-and-pop player post-injury who offered a lot of the same things on offense as Rashid Wallace, while also still being a very good defender off the bench, as he would have the lowest defensive rating of any non-starter in 2005. He would give the Pistons valuable minutes and help them to the league's second ranked scoring defense, and with Detroit playing at the slowest pace in the league, it was easier on McDice's knees, as he would appear in 77 games this season, hitting double figures in 40 of them and recording 6 double doubles, while shooting over 51%. The Pistons would finish the year at 54 and 28 and would get a first round playoff matchup with Philly. McDice would start great as he averaged 13 and a half points, 8 rebounds and 1 and a half blocks in the first 2 games as Detroit went up 2-0. But he would score a combined 16 points over the next 3 games as Detroit won in 5 and advanced to face Indiana in round 2. Detroit would win this series in 6 games and although it would be a quiet one for McDice as he averaged about 7 points and 5 rebounds. He also helped hold Pacer star Jermaine O'Neal to below 38% shooting. So in their return to the conference finals, they would face the Miami Heat, featuring Shaq and D. Wade. McDice would play his best in a Game 1 win with 10 points and 6 rebounds, but wouldn't crack double figures the rest of the series. However, he would provide good rebounding off the bench, as he had at least 5 boards in 5 of the 7 games in a Detroit series win. As McDice was advancing to his first NBA Finals, waiting for the Pistons were the San Antonio Spurs in what would be a 7 game defensive battle with Detroit being the only team to crack 100 points when they had 102 in a game 4 win. Unfortunately, the Pistons would come up short and lose the championship, yet McDice would have a great series off the bench as he would average over 10 points and 7 rebounds on over 50% shooting and would hit double figures in 5 of the 7 games. And he would also play a part in holding Tim Duncan to below 42% shooting for the series. But McDice's first season in Detroit saw him average about 9.5 points, 6.5 rebounds, and half a block per game. Going into 06, the Pistons had a new coach in Flip Saunders, but still had their same starting five, with McDice acting as sixth man. And for the first time in his career, he would appear in all 82 games. His minutes had dropped slightly, leading to his averages dropping slightly, but he remained efficient, shooting over 50%. He would hit double figures in 27 games and record five double-doubles. And under Saunders, the Pistons were still a slow-paced team with a top three scoring defense as they would end up being the league's best regular season team, finishing with the league best 64-18 record. The first round would bring the Milwaukee Bucks, and McDice would be great, as he would average about 11.5 points and finish second to Ben Wallace with 8.5 rebounds per game. He would hit double figures in 4 games, including an 11-point, 11-rebound double-double in a Game 4 win, as the Pistons would win in 5, setting up a second round matchup versus Cleveland. McDice would start strong with 12 points and 3 blocks in a Game 1 win, but would then score 8 points combined with 0 blocks over the next 3 games. He would have 11 points and 11 rebounds in Game 5, 
but the Pistons would lose to fall behind 3-2. Yet even though McDice wouldn't have a major impact the rest of the series, the Pistons would win the next two to advance to the conference finals in a rematch with Miami. But it would have a different outcome, as Miami would win in six games. McDice was only able to average about six points and five rebounds for the series, as Wade and Shaq played lights out. But McDice would have a great game five to stave off elimination when he put up 12 points on five of five from the field. But his regular season would see him average about eight points, five and a half rebounds, and half a block per game. Going into 07, the Pistons were missing their man in the middle as Ben Wallace had left to sign with Chicago. Rasheed Wallace would be shifted to center as McDice would continue coming off the bench. And after a few months, Detroit would sign Chris Webber to be their starting power forward the rest of the year. McDice would once again play 82 games, hitting double figures in 30 of them, while recording eight double doubles and shooting nearly 53%. And he would see himself get in a bit of a fight with the Timberwolves Kevin Garnett in a January 19th game. However, only Garnett would be suspended as it was determined that only he threw a punch. Even without Big Ben, the Pistons still boasted the second best scoring defense in the league as they would finish at 53 and 29 and get a first round matchup versus Orlando. But McDice would have a rough first round as although it was a sweep for Detroit, McDice would only average five and a half points on 25% shooting. However, he would lead the team in rebounding with about nine and a half per game. The second round versus Chicago would be much of the same as McDice averaged six points on less than 37% shooting, but would pull down almost eight rebounds per game as the Pistons would win in six to advance to yet another conference finals, this time versus LeBron James and the Cavs. McDice's struggles continued, as although it would be his most efficient series, shooting nearly 42%, he would only average about 6 points and 5 rebounds per game, as Cleveland took the series in 6. However, it may have been different if McDice hadn't been ejected in the first quarter of Game 5 for a hard foul on Anderson Vergeau, a game that Cleveland ended up winning by 2 points. But for the regular season, McDice would average about 8 points, six rebounds, and a block per game. Weber was gone, so going into 08, McDice would be a full-time starter for the first time since 2001. As a starter, he would hit double figures in 34 games while recording 16 double-doubles. Although Detroit's core was getting up there in age, they still remained one of the best teams in the league, as they boasted the top scoring defense and the best scoring offense during McDice's time there, and they would finish with a 59-23 record to get a first-round playoff matchup with Philly. McDice was up and down to start the series, scoring just 6 points on 2 of 9 shooting in Game 1, but coming back with 16 and 12 in Game 2. But then with Detroit going down 2-1 in the series, Saunders would elect to start Jason Maxiel and bring McDice off the bench. And although McDice would only average 6 points and 3 rebounds over the rest of the series, Detroit would win 3 straight to advance to the second round. McDice continued coming off the bench versus Orlando, but after a hamstring injury sidelined Billups after Game 3, McDice would return to the starting lineup, and in his first game back as a starter, he went for 8 points and 14 rebounds in a win, then followed that up with 17 and 11 in another win, as Detroit advanced to their 6th straight conference finals. They would have Boston and their new super team waiting for them, and would unfortunately get bounced in 6 games, but McDice played great, as he would average about 11 points and 9 rebounds on over 56% shooting with his best performance coming in a Game 4 win, when he had 21 points and 16 rebounds. But for the regular season, McDice averaged about 9 points, 8.5 rebounds, and half a block per game. But this would be the end of this era of Pistons basketball. After appearing in the first two games of the 09 season for Detroit, McDice was included in a trade to Denver, which saw the Pistons also trade Chauncey Billups and acquire Allen Iverson. Yet Denver would immediately buy out McDice, and after waiting the league-mandated 30-day period, he would re-sign with Detroit on December 9th. McDice would begin coming off the bench before finding himself back in the starting lineup for the final 30 games of the year, but he would still have 28 games in double figures, 16 double doubles, and even a career-high 22 rebounds to go along with 21 points in a March 11th loss to New York. As overall, the Pistons, now coached by Michael Curry, would not have the same dominant defense and also have a bottom three offense, and they would finish at 39 and 43 yet this would be enough for the 8th seed and a first round matchup with Cleveland. Detroit would be swept, but McDice would play great, as he averaged 13 points and 8.5 rebounds on over 52% shooting, as he would even tie his postseason career high with 26 points and 10 rebounds in a Game 4 loss. But his regular season would see him average about 9.5 points, 10 rebounds, and a block per game. During the offseason, a soon-to-be 35-year-old McDice would sign with San Antonio. He reportedly wasn't their first choice, and they preferred the Pistons' other big man, Rasheed Wallace. But he ended up signing with Boston, so they settled for McDice. And although McDice put together a surprising five-year run in Detroit, it would become evident that the years were catching up to him in 2010. 
The Spurs had also acquired Richard Jefferson and featured their trio of Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, and Manu Ginobili. Yet Parker would struggle with a hand injury this year, limiting him to 56 games. McDice split time starting alongside Duncan and also backing him up yet often playing out of position as center. He would appear in 77 games and start 50 of them, but his numbers were down, and he would fail to crack 20 points even once, while only recording three double-doubles. But the Spurs would still manage a 50-32 and 32 record, which would get them a first-round matchup versus Dallas. McDice would be a starter throughout the series, and would give the Spurs valuable defensive minutes, while also averaging about 6.5 points and 7 rebounds on over 54% shooting, as San Antonio won in 6, to advance to a matchup with Phoenix. McDice would continue his solid play, averaging 7 points and 6.5 rebounds on 52% shooting, but Parker still wasn't at 100% as the Spurs would eventually be swept. But McDice's season saw him average about 6 points, 6 rebounds, and half a block per game. McDice would appear in 73 games for the Spurs in the 2011 season, but he was back to being a rotation player, as he was only getting 19 minutes per game and putting up some of the lowest numbers of his career. He would still be a valuable contributor, just not a difference maker. But the Spurs didn't need that, as with a healthy Parker, they would finish with the West's best record at 61-21. But a shocking first round series would see Memphis upset San Antonio in 6 games. McDice would be a starter for the series, but would only manage about 5.5 points and 5 rebounds on less than 42% shooting. But his regular season saw him average about 5.5 points, 5.5 rebounds, and half a block per game. The lockout occurred during the offseason, and shortly before the season started, the Spurs would waive McDice after not being able to coax him into playing one more year, as he would retire. Antonio McDice was one of the purest athletes that has ever played in the NBA, yet seldom mentioned in that conversation. A couple weeks in 1995 vaulted him into the lottery pick conversation, and he let his raw talent carry him to a couple good years in Denver. But as the years went on, he was showing a polished game as more than just a slasher and dunker. He was reaching his peak during his second stint in Denver before injuries made him human again and forced him to reinvent himself as a player. And although he is a player who couldn't play at near the same level post-injury, he is also a player that modified his game better than most to remain effective and healthy for years after. A valuable role player on some great teams over the second half of his career, he gave you everything you wanted on both sides of the ball. It would have been great to see what an injury-free career would have looked like for Antonio McDice, but when you're in high demand both pre and post injury, that's pretty impressive. But that's it for today's episode on Antonio McDice. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on one of his early career Denver teammates, or this one on one of his teammates in Detroit. Thanks for watching and see you next time.